You know, sometimes I'll go to my local mall just to hang out. With the lockdown slowly releasing constraints, I just miss wasting time at the local shops and window shopping. And the other day, when I was visiting a sport card shop because they had stocked the latest Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon card, I had to stop when I came across a rather haphazardly put together display. Didn't I already do this? And I just burn. This video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Yes, my friends, Raid has taken over again and your game will never be the same. Raid is the first game to bring a true console level experience to your phone, and once you get started, you'll never want to stop. Experience both countless champion combinations and tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions blessed with unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. Have it your way, my friends! And my way is with Venus and Queen Eva. Venus is an extremely versatile offensive support champion who you can put some extremely powerful debuffs. This imposing beauty can attack an enemy twice with a chance to poison them. And she can also debuff your enemies through AoEs, and deals an impressive HP burn to your enemies too. Don't forget about her aura, which can help boost your allies' HP by 30%. Definitely a character you want on your team. And we certainly can't forget about Queen Eva, a boss character in the campaign you can get to help you fight. And you won't regret having this queen in your cart with her utility skills. She's one of the few champions in the game that can put out a block revive debuff. And with the correct setup, she's useful in both PvE and PvP. These are only a couple of the champions you can get in Raid, and a good timing to try them out too. Raid's running an amazing trick or treat promotion Halloween, where you can win a bunch of real life and in game prizes, including a $1,000 Amazon gift card and some of the best epic and legendary Halloween champions in Raid. The best part? It's all free and super easy to do. All you need is your Raid player ID. Just download Raid with my link in the description, then head to the trickortreatplarium.com to make it even easier. I linked it in the description too. From there, just enter your details, then spin the wheel and get your prize, folks. That's it! Don't wait around. This special event runs October 15th to the 5th, and once it's over, it's over, so be fast. There's seriously never been a better time to get started, but there's more. You can also use Dark Rise's promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level up any of your strongest champions all the way to level 50, 5 Star Ascension. Promo code is available for both new and existing players until October 25th. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion Tariel, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 EXP boost, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon off some champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure is waiting for you here, so don't delay. Sign up to Raid Shadow Legends today, because this will only be available for the next 30 days. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, so let's get back to the spookiness, my friends. Honestly, when I made my last video talking about horror games, I had no idea it would get swept up in the algorithm pick up nearly half a million views, which, thanks there, guys. But there was a comment that I kept seeing that would be popping up every once in a while. Modern horror. I think you mean mainstream. And upon retrospect, yeah, that's a fair comment. A lot of the games I talked about, Five Nights at Freddy's, Bendy and the Ink Machine, Poppy's Playtime, yeah, those are what you can consider mainstream. I guess. They were all initially developed by indie creators and still to this day managed to be considered very popular horror franchises, and whether you like it or not, they are the face of modern day horror games due to their sheer popularity. There are plenty of horror games that don't fall into the trappings of what I talked about, and today I kind of want to talk about that aspect, and what makes a good horror game and a bad horror game. So says Mr. Stewart. Manga common here. Now. Out of the get-go, a subject like this is going to be highly opinionated. After all, everyone's got different standards and tolerances, as well as how much of a prick you want to be online to an online audience. What I say here isn't the be-all, end-all, and I actually encourage people to respond to what I say here. Yes, the title says the right and wrong way, but it's YouTube. I gotta try to at least get people to click on my video. As I said in my previous one, I've been playing horror games ever since I was a little kid, sneaking Silent Hill in my grandma's basement so I couldn't be scolded by my parents for daring to play a game that was considered satanic at the time. Then again, I grew up in the time where Pokemon was considered satanic. So Pokemon is a game that teaches children how to enter into the world of witchcraft, how to cast spells, how to use psychic phenomena, how to put work supernatural powers against their enemies, how to fantasy role play. Pokemon World is a world of the demonic, of the satanic. 
Hell, man, I wish I could cast spells because I played Pokemon. Your children knew, need to know there's a devil, and he hates them, and he wants to ruin their life. That being said, in today's video, we'll be talking about a number of topics here. Environment and isolation, gameplay, mystery and story, and of course, fear. Spoilers for the following games you'll see on screen. Since as early as the Neolithic era, humankind has defined itself by its buildings. Buildings for worship, buildings for socializing, buildings for protection, even buildings for the commemoration of the dead. Environment, atmosphere, tone, isolation. Horror games need to thrive on these aspects, because let's face it, if you're setting your horror game in a happy-go-lucky amusement park during the day with plenty of people, it's not going to be an effective horror experience. However, if you take a few moments and spin the lens a little bit, you can definitely make that setting work. Let's take a few moments and consider a few of the horror games that I find to be very effective, as well as their environments to be memorable. Soma, an underwater research station. Dead Space, abandoned ship called the Ishimura. Outlast, a mental institution. Eve, a corrupted art museum. Silent Hill 2, a fog-covered town in many dark areas. Five Nights at Freddy's, a pizzeria at night that's seen better days. Inscription's first half, a dark cabin in the woods. Iron Lung, a rusty and beaten up submarine that's on the verge of breaking apart. I think it should be obvious that some of the best horror games out there take advantage of the darkness, the unknown, the claustrophobic, and of course, the loneliness of the locations. Even if you're in a location like Soma's Pathos 2, which is pretty much a big map and location, the insides of each individual base has a lot of dark locations, winding corridors, and limited space for the player to operate in. Sometimes you'll never know what's around the corner in a game and it can either be nothing to worry about, or it can be a monster's wound to pluck out your eyes just because you bumped into something. If you look at Iron Lung, a game essentially has you go around in a single room for the entirety of the game, most of the fear comes from the isolation aspect and how you're just floating around in a lake of blood where you barely have enough room to actually walk around. This stems from what I think a lot of humans like to think what we have. Freedom. Think about it, if you're in trouble, what's the first thing you're going to do? You want help. You see, we as humans are social creatures, whether we want to admit it or not. You need human interaction in your daily life, especially when you're in trouble. Isolation is the one thing you don't want to be when you're in trouble, whether because you got a flat tire on the side of the road, you nicked your finger on a knife, or you trapped yourself in an underwater base. That's because isolation is a psychological effect that breeds discomfort, fear, and can cause us to perform erratic behavior. Like, you only need to watch a Markiplier Let's Play to see him react when he's being chased by a monster. Power of my bones into little pieces. Oh my god! That's the thing about isolation too, when you think you're alone, but then you're not. It's an effective subterfuge that a lot of horror games encode into themselves because the longer you're alone in an area or location, the more your mind begins to play tricks on you. Oh, blimey. Things such as the floorboards creaking, you step on a twig, snapping it, or the shadows at night when you're walking home alone. Those can create the feelings of fear that a lot of horror games can make use of. A game called Fears to Fathom has this aspect going on too. In the first chapter, you are being a kid who's home alone with a stranger trying to get inside your house. It works really well. Since there are times where your mind can play tricks on you and the game capitalizes on that, it's why the trope of let's split up gang is a thing, albeit it's clunkily done in horror movies and games since it tries to get the characters isolated in situations that tend to favor being together be the better plan instead. It's like games like Soma and Iron Lung which put you right off the bat in isolation situations that don't have to deal with these issues. For those who aren't familiar with the two games, Soma you play as a guy named Simon who's going in for a brain scan and when he gets his brain scanned he wakes up in a future in an underwater research facility. And like I said before with Iron Lung, you're a criminal who's been tasked to survey a lake of blood in a small dinky submarine which you can't see out of save for a photograph every few moments. Now, these aren't the only effective ways to isolate your character in a horror game, just two of the more prominent examples that come to my mind. There are many other ways to make your character isolated from friendlies, and even splitting off from the group can work. Take Until Dawn for an example of a, a semi-good reason. You mean Mike? What? Uh, I mean, you know. When the party splits up, they don't think that they're in danger. Two of the characters are just going off to get their freak on in a more isolated area. It isn't until later that the danger really starts to rear its ugly head, that's when it begins to get dumb to split up. That's why I said it's a semi-good example, because later on the group does the dumb things and splits the party when there's a clear danger and it can result in death. You see, this falls into logic. There's a single killer roaming around the campsite, it makes more sense to gang up on the guy and beat his ass rather than splitting up so we can pick you off one at a time. 
There are logical reasons for the isolation, and it doesn't break the immersion factor, which is important when it comes to playing horror games. I do want to bring up something else before we move on to the gameplay portion, and that's you don't always need to have a creepy, dank, and dark location to make an effective horror game. I mean, it helps, but there's been this aspect of what I like to refer to as cute horror. It's a set of games that actually make use of the bright and colorful aspects in order to lure its audience into a false sense of security into what they're playing isn't actually a horror game. Games like Omori, Doki Doki Literature Club, and many more. Granted, I don't really want to go too far into the subject since there are a lot of games that can fall into it, and a lot of them are good. If you watched my previous video, you know that I'm a gameplay guy first and foremost when it comes to games. But not all games need to be the pinnacle of hack and slashes like Devil May Cry 5. As long as a game isn't frustrating, I can tolerate different types of games. But before we get to the good examples, let's talk about bad examples. Let's talk about DEATH. Death in video games has always been a bit of a weird topic to talk about, more specifically in horror games. And there are a number of factors to this. One of the biggest is repetition. Most notably, things tend to get less scary the more you experience them, both in the long term and short term. Let's take a moment to explain what I mean. Imagine that we're watching a horror flick where we see a rather handsome devil as the main protagonist, and he gets caught by a monster and is immediately killed. And for good measure, let's throw in the jump scare that's loud. Wow, son. However, the flick suffers a glitch, and then we have to go back before he was killed, and he tries something a little different. Only to get killed again. Now imagine this can happen in every scene for the rest of the movie, three to four times. What I'm getting at is when you die repeatedly, it doesn't elicit feelings of fear, rather it makes you more and more frustrated, especially if you don't know how to solve the issue and escape this kind of, you know, death. Take, for example, Outlast 2, a game I feel has bigger issues with it since it has extremely limited gameplay options for how you can get out of situations. And I'm not just talking about how you can't fight back at all, although we'll get back to that in a little bit. No, no, no. It's because you're essentially forced to just run around in trial and error and figure out which path will allow you to slither into the next area just so you can repeat yourself again and again. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm just the guy who has the power of Google on his side, but repetition in games is something that can be a positive thing. It's why people can enjoy playing the same game again and again. Insert Metal Gear Rising reference here. But that's the caveat with this positive reinforcement, and as you can imagine, death is a negative reinforcement most of the time. So when you're forced to face similar situations again and again, it's going to be a bit of a pain in your ass to deal with. And that's probably the worst way a horror game can be designed, since horror games are reliant on scaring the player, which, while a lot of people can get a thrill out of, is still technically a negative experience. So you'd have to be careful when you're crafting your horror game, because fear is a negative emotion. And adding on to that, you have the other negative emotions of loss and monotony, and that's a bad combination. But that's just one style of gameplay where you're basically unarmed and can only run and hide, a gameplay style that I've expressed in the past that I'm not a huge fan of. There's a bit of a large trend in the 2010s to the present that used to be for horror games to be scary, you had to lack the ability to fight against the big scary monsters that chased you around. Now, there's a good argument that can be made that if you hunt down these monsters, that hurts the horror aspect. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. Now, I'm obviously being hyperbolic in my response to that argument, because it depends on the game itself, but I don't think that doing a broad generalization on horror games works for that, especially when I can point to examples that counter it, which I'll get into in a second. Again, take Outlast 2. You lack the ability to be defensive if you were caught, and funnily enough, Resident Evil 2 Remake gives a great example of how you can absolutely have defensive gameplay for horror games without actively being able to hunt down and kill the monsters. And that's to include defensive weapons. What I mean is that in the RE2 remake, you're allowed to pick up things like knives and flash grenades. So when you're grabbed by a ghoulie, you can escape from taking damage by sacrificing one of these defensive weapons. And boom, there you go. Not only do you include a bit more complexity with resource management of these items, but you give the player more agency as well as a means of escaping from repetitiveness that are possibly dying. Throwing that these items aren't the most common things to come across, and you'll have the player have more options, albeit limited. Which leads into my next point. Limitations. I know this is going to sound contradictory considering I just walked out of a portion where I criticized Outlast 2 and its limited gameplay to just running and hiding, but give me a minute before you start chucking knives at me. When I refer to limitations, I'm more or less referring to resource management, and again, RE2 Remake is probably the best example of this because not only do you have limited inventory space that you can carry items on, but you also have limited amount of resources as well. And while you can definitely improve your inventory, considering that these Zomboys don't go down in one hit most of the time, as well as... 
Looking to give you a reason to send you to the dentist. Knock, knock, open up the door. So you'd have to consider when's a good time to fight or run, going into the fight or flight response that people have when faced with something that is dangerous to us. Granted, there are times when this even fails, like when you're able to escape Mr. X because of the safe rooms. And there's not really a good reason for why he can't enter the rooms to lay a smackdown on you. Though if you're cocky enough, you can still get your ass handed to you in a safe room. It's kind of also the reason why FNAF Security Breach didn't do it for me as a horror game. Like, I'm not trying to ignore that the game had its issues late last year, and that more than recently the game got a patch to fix some things, but gameplay-wise, there wasn't a lot of things that made sense to me. Such as the hiding mechanic, because you could hide right in front of an animatronic and for some reason you just disappeared, and don't get me started on the bins with no tops on them. I can buy Roxy's eyes getting ripped out and her not finding you in that way, but before then and with the other animatronics, ugh. Who's there? If Freddy get out of my room. I don't want to go hard on this game, again, for the third time, especially after it was patched, but let's just say there's a lot of stuff in the gameplay that I still take issue with. Now we've established that I've got issues with both games that don't allow you to fight back and focus on running away, but what about games that do allow you to fight back? Considering that I brought up Resident Evil 2's remake, that should probably mean that I greatly appreciate games where you can shoot the bad guys, right? <laughs> Wrong! Because believe it or not, there's this thing called extremes, and while I don't appreciate the extreme of not being able to do anything to fight off enemies, the opposite holds true as well. Because while I can appreciate being able to fight back against hungry hungry werewolves that want to chomp down on my succulent bootay, Resident Evil Village is probably a game that I have more mixed feelings about than YouTube's blatant double standards. I think it stems that the game was intentionally designed to be less scary than RE7, as stated by the developers themselves. Which I think is a bad move. Especially considering that a lot of games have had slaky decisions by Capcom in the past, which apparently also had fan feedback pump into them and then came out worse for wear. Now, Resident Evil Village is not a bad game by any stretch, but it's clear to me that a lot of attention went more into shooty shooty bang bang aspect of the game, to the point where the only part of the actual game that can be considered scary quote unquote, is when you're dealing with a giant fetus. And it's a part I don't personally like because it takes away the agency and weapons that you had before. And while you're getting your pitchforks and torches for the weekly Tiki Harvest Festival to roast me, where's everyone going? Bingo? Let's touch on one more aspect of gaming that I find weak in horror games. Limited gameplay can be effective. Going back to Iron Lung again, while I wouldn't say that this is gameplay is my cup of tea, and I died a few many times by crashing into walls, the limited gameplay works well with the creative nature of the game. To me, there needs to be a bit of a balance with these kinds of games, because again, if you're expecting your audience to stick around and deal with your horrors, you don't want to push them away with annoying gameplay mechanics. In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday. Story, mystery, intrigue, mystique. A hook is needed to get your players to continue onwards into the game, and sometimes a mystery is the greatest aspect in order to get people into it. Whether it be searching through a mysterious town and fog to find your missing daughter, or getting a letter from your dead wife, to trying to survive the zombie-infested Raccoon City, there needs to be motivation for the player to want to be able to face the scary and disturbing aspects that your game will have in order for it to be effective. Sometimes, though, you don't need a motive other than just surviving. Take, for example, the Little Nightmares games, because although they are practically devoid of any sort of verbal communication, it instead allows the story to be told in the background of sorts. Which is something that video games are the kings at. It's an aspect that games tend to head over other forms of media due to the sheer interactivity and exploration that you can get with movies or books. That isn't to say that other mediums can't have background storytelling, it's just that I think video games are better at it. Which is why I had to roll my eyes whenever a story is given to me in random journal entries and notes, because when they describe the terrible events that are going on, that someone just so happened to be scared and frantic, managed to find time to either write down or record their thoughts. Ah, oh, a giant monster, but give me a second while I make this random TikTok explaining how Nemesis is about to strangle me to death. Holla, like and subscribe! <laughs> Like, I know that's very specific, but F me if I haven't seen a good chunk of that in horror games nowadays. And I understand that sometimes you need to be able to convey your story in ways that make somewhat sense in the isolation aspect that I talked about. When I see those kinds of notes, it just takes me out of it. Like, if you want an example, I could point to a couple of audio logs in Dead Space that fit that bill. Such as the one guy who recorded himself shooting off his own limbs! It's even worse when the notes are miles long and it's just so boring! 
Grand, I also have an issue when it comes to too much mystery in a game and no resolution. To make it clear, not every mystery in a story needs to be solved, but there's a reason why Chekhov's gun is a thing. For those who don't know, aka failing high school English or don't know what Chekhov's gun is, it's a writing principle that essentially states that anything introduced or described in the story must have a purpose, either immediately or eventually. Now, this isn't a rule or a guideline. I'm not the kind of guy who thinks you have to follow everything like this to a T, especially when it comes to mysteries and story and other creative writing. I I've said this before, but sometimes having a mystery left unsolved can be useful for creators to get people talking about your game. Need I bring up game theory again? But also, as I've stated before, you can't just rely on pure mystery or your audience to fill in the blanks of your story. I brought this up with Bendy the Ink Machine in my previous video, but let's talk about Iron Lung. I know I keep coming back to this game, but that's because initially the script was going to be talking about the game alone, but I figured let's get a little bit more broad with this topic. Anyway, the game has a lot of questions raised in the beginning. Only a small amount of humanity exists, there's mysterious lakes of blood appearing in space, you're a criminal who's forced to traverse the body of blood. I like and dislike it as it proposes a lot of questions for the player to think about, but my biggest issue is it can come off as a window dressing and not actually be addressed in the game itself. It kind of just throws Chekhov's gun back in your face since the mysteries aren't really solved in the game. And I'm not going to discount how effective the mystery aspect of horror games can be. FNAF practically built its fan base and popularity about all the theories and mystery around the story that was being told in the games. Now, granted, the thing about games is you don't even need to have a deep story for it to be effective, but if you're going to put a story in a game, you need to consider what you're putting in it. Like, again, Outlast 2, a game that I really don't like, has a really messy story. When you're playing the game, you're given a message of... Pfft. Religion, right? I'm not even sure it's even that because the game also undermines it because the fanatic cultists were correct? Or at least in the eyes of the protagonist, and that's not even considering the theory that it's all hallucination. They're on the fact that the flashbacks don't really lead up to anything substantive that's happening in the present, but whatever. Or how about Resident Evil Village, a game whose story I found to be convoluted and rather dumb considering a lot of the conflict between Ethan and Chris Redfield could have been solved with a few words. Now that I think about it, Mia helped create the bioweapon in 7. Why did she just get off scot-free? Ah, I don't have time for this. Granted, while I do appreciate stories at least attempting to hide their lore and not just be splayed out so people to just ignore it, at the same time, there are games that get under my skin. Like, it's really obvious what they're trying to do here and just basically bank on the hidden lore. Andy's Apple Farm, which... Yes, I assure you, is a horror game, has this as well, where it has a lot of hidden lore into what has a creepy undertone with it, with a cute mask hanging over it. Hey, good job. You caught a fish. Now, there's nothing wrong with this inherently, but as of late, there's been a surge of these types of games appearing in the World Wide Web, and for good reason. These kinds of stories and lore games get a lot of attention, and fandoms based upon them. Not to mention, they tend to get the eye of YouTubers who play their games and expose them to their vast audiences. My worry with this is that there are games that will be used as a means to farm cheap thrill here and there, earning a quick buck, and it wouldn't be the first time this sort of thing happened in the past. You only need to go back to the days of Slender Clones that suffocated the internet for a few ages years back. Sometimes these games can be effective as horror games, but other times they feel cheap. They don't have the soul of creativity, and I don't say that lightly. I bring this up because there's a fundamental flaw in horror games that we need to discuss as well. I'm about to say something that can be considered rather controversial. Do horror games need to be scary? I know, it sounds like a dumb question, but do they? There are several types of horror games, and as such, there are various types of horror. You got the typical fear-inducing horror, horror being used as set dressing, and psychological horror. There's a lot more, I know, but I don't think we really need to do a deep dive into nitty gritty on that. In my opinion, horror games are an oddity, because let me point something out. Silent Hill, when I was younger, would scare me, but at the same time, something like Resident Evil, not so much. Albert Wesker. Resident Evil. Both these games were made on the same console, have the same visual elements to them, but one I considered scary and the other not. Now, you can easily chalk this up to the fact that they have a different genre, where Silent Hill was more psychological horror and Resident Evil was more survival. But that's my point. Do horror games need to be scary to be effective horror games? That's really the question that I want to propose to you guys, and would like to get your thoughts on it, since I can't really have a definitive answer. And hey, gotta give you guys an excuse to leave a comment. What I will give as a definitive statement on is jump scares. Brew! Gotcha. Scared you. Scared you.
I want to say that jump scares can be effective in the right way. And in all honesty, the best and worst way how to do them are in the FNAF series. Yar, you win some, you lose some. Take FNAF 1 for example, the jump scares in the games are used as failure states. To me, that's the best way to go about it. It's a punishment for you screwing up in the game, and it's something that the player wants to avoid. The worst example is Five Nights at Freddy's 3, where a good portion of jump scares are, well, they don't kill you. It's essentially become a jump scare simulator, and you can argue that they do punish you, but they don't end the game. They don't act as a failure state and actively just make the game harder on you. And hey, if you're a masochist, then I suppose this kind of jump scare is good for you, but to me, jump scares are a cheap way to get a good shot of fear jolted into you. It's not inherently scary, it's shocking, which is not the same thing. But again and again, this happens in games, and why I don't particularly care for jump scares. Incoming typical YouTuber food analogy, as jump scares are basically a bag of chips. Yeah, it'll stop your stomach from grumbling, but it's not good for you, especially in bigger numbers as you consume more and more. Meanwhile, a game like Soma had me question what I thought I was and wasn't human, and still haunts me to this day of whether or not I exist. Manga Common is just a bad dream. I think what also affects how a jump scare can be actually effective is how much the tool is used as well. Let's go back to Resident Evil 7 for a moment. RE7 has a lot of different scares, and while there are jump scares, I feel they're spaced out enough and have enough scares in them make them at least a little bit more effective and not oversaturated, which leads to my own personal preference to fear. I like to have my own preconceived notions and sanity questioned by horror because when you get right down to it, what makes me tremble the most is my own mortal coil and what will happen to me once I fall off it or if I actually do exist in the here and now. And I want that feeling of being in danger too, which is something that you have to consider when you know that what you're playing isn't actually real, so immersion is something that you need to have. So when I see Mr. X not being able to get into the safe room, Claire, where'd you go? Nemesis being stopped by a door and etc, it really takes me out of it, so there's gotta be some semblance of a threat. That's what really scares me, but it doesn't mean I don't find other horror games to be at the the very least interesting, and the same goes for horror-themed games too. Hell, if we go back in time, one of, if not one of the most first ever horror games was 3D Monster Maze. It was probably very popular and scary for its time, but uh, I, I wouldn't know. It came out before I even existed. But for all things considered, the mind is a powerful tool, and even games with the not-so-polished 3D graphics can be scary. It's because the mind will often fill in the blank, too. So graphics, while important to some degree, aren't that all important in the guard to make it scary or not. I can still be scared by Uboa-chan and Yume Niki, a very old retro RPG horror game. So yeah, what do we do with all this now? Hey, shh, shh, shh. I know, I know, I know. I'm not gonna hurt you. Hell, I'd never would have if I could've helped you. Let's face it, there is no definitive answer how to make a horror game. To me, I prefer psychological horror that sticks with you more, but I don't discount games with good gameplay either. Really all depends on each person's own preferences when it comes to horror games, but it doesn't really mean that there aren't problems in modern day horror games. Frankly, I really do hope that horror games nowadays actually put the scares and thrills in first and not just use them as a means to make money really quick and to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Unfortunately, for today's standard, we live in a time where consuming media has become extremely easy to do and people will binge as much as they can if they like something. To me, that's probably one of the bigger issues with horror games or media in general, the oversaturation and overindulgence of the materials that we consume. There's always a race to make the biggest and scariest horror game, and we see a lot of things being rushed or corners being cut, and it feels like there are issues that are being ignored just to push it out. And it doesn't just affect things like graphics or bugs, but things such as even the story and horror as well. But hey, as a YouTuber who just plays games is just offering up his jumbled thoughts as talking points about this topic, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this, so uh, that's what the comments section's all about. And hey, I'm Manga Common, and have a happy Halloween, everyone. Restless dreams. I see that town. Silent Hill. Oh man! Oh god!